Good morning, everyone. And um, thank you to the organizers for accepting my um, abstract and uh, inviting me to join the session, which I'm very pleased to do. Um, when I read the abstract for the session, it sort of, um, uh, you, you know, there was a thread in it that I, I really recognized, and I thought I could make this small contribution. So um, I've got a bit of a theme running through, which is fire, which is obviously a very emotive subject and very elemental. Um, but um, the good news is that something good comes out of the fire. But I, when I was doing some research for the paper, I um, was reminded about uh, the great Sir Christopher Wren, the, the architect who built St Paul's Cathedral in London. And he actually put a, a phoenix rising from the ashes, the mythical phoenix, um, after the great fire of London, um, you know, to uh, inspire everyone to keep going, I suppose. But anyway. Okay, so um, I was, the, the, the sentence that struck a chord with me was that archaeological collections are invaluable for sources of reconstructing different aspects of histories of archaeology. And that's what I hope to just uh, do this morning. And also to emphasize the importance of collections. I was, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Society of Antiquaries of London. Uh, I'm actually honorary secretary of, at the moment of the Society of Antiquaries of London. <laughs> privilege. But it's quite a lot of work actually, but anyway, <laughs> well, I just thought you, uh, I'd uh, tell you a little bit about their collections. And then I've got a little case study about William Lucas. Many of you have heard me talk about the Lucas family before, but um, this is just a little uh, case study of some of the work that William did and um, what happened to it and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, Fire is very destructive, as we know. We are watched with horror. Sorry, uh, Nathan, if this <laughs> gets to your heart more than anything. But um, some famous fires we had in the UK, York Minster, uh, where the fantastic rose window was lost. Windsor Castle, where Her Majesty the Queen of England said it was her Annus Horribilis, because lots of horrible things had happened last, that year. And colleagues who are now historic England um, worked very hard to um, unpick all the archaeology and, and what remained under all that ash and everything. The uh, Clandon House is a sort of stately home in England run by the National Trust. And then horrors of horrors of the National Museum of Brazil, uh, where they lost nearly 90% of their collections. It just, just doesn't bear thinking about, does it? And I don't know if any colleagues were involved in that, but um, lots of um, things that really make you stop and think and very painful. Anyway, we'll move on to something hopefully a bit more cheerful. So the Society of Antiquaries of London uh, was established as a learned society in 1717. And it really goes back to, it grew out of the Enlightenment and uh, goes back to Sir Isaac Newton, the great scientist, who really wanted to, at that time, separate science from the humanities. And when the Royal Society was formed in England, in London, he wanted it specifically for science. So um, some, uh, uh, they were all men at the time, decided they wanted to meet together to talk about antiquities and the humanities, and were better to do it than in the pub on a Friday night. <laughs> so they used to meet in the Bear Tavern, a pub in London, it's not there anymore, on Friday nights at six o'clock and discuss um, things that they, they wanted to discuss, um, particularly antiquities, but it covered quite a range of things, as you'll see in a minute. Uh, in 1920, suitable women were invited to join, you'll be pleased to know. And we did get our first woman president in Dame Joan Evans, who was elected uh, not till 1959, though. Um, and today there are over 3,000 fellows, and the society celebrated its tercentenary 300 years in 2007. <laughs> Uh, but I thought there was a little connection in that this lamp of knowledge, they thought it was a Roman lamp, was used as a symbol for a ticket for the society. And as you can see, there's sort of smoke coming from the lamp. In fact, it's a medieval lamp, it's not a Roman one, but it's still used today as part of the logo of the uh, society. So the society has fantastic collections. Uh, over four, 45,000 artifacts, material culture, fine and decorative arts, and objects that are valuable in themselves, but also illustrate the history of the society. So an invaluable source for anyone who wants to study the history of the society, but also in the development of many disciplines, including archeology. 
Uh, the collections today cover a wide range. I've just put a few on here. The bronze shield was discovered in Wales in 1784. And actually, this is a drawing. It's not a photograph. In those days, they uh, engaged a man called John Carter to do these wonderful drawings. They almost look like photographs, but of course, they didn't have the benefit of photography. Um, the many paintings in the collection. There was a carriage bequest and this fabulous painting of Mary I. If any of you have visited, I'll talk a little bit about that later on as well. Um, this painting hangs in the meeting room and it's really fabulous. The picture doesn't really do justice to it. Um, it's the Society of Antiquaries of London, of course. So we have a, a diptych of old St. Paul's Cathedral that I mentioned earlier on. This is by uh, John Gipkin in 1616. Um, there's a picture of uh, Count's Cup Manor, which is also owned by the Society and is, um, was the home of William Morris, who of course was the father of the arts and crafts movement. Um, there's the famous Hoxney Axe, which uh, was found in Norfolk uh, by John Freer, who famously wrote an account of flint weapons uh, to the Society, and he said these tools date <coughs> from a very remote period indeed, and I love this expression even beyond the present world. And of course, very crucial to the study of prehistory today. And last but not least, um, I put in this medieval seal of Robert, son of John. Now, we haven't a clue who Robert, son of John was, but it's just to illustrate the point that some artifacts don't necessarily have to belong to anybody famous or rich or whatever, whatever, um, but they can give us quite a lot of information. Whoever Robert was, he, he had his own seal. It got broken, it tells you a little bit about the design, tells you a little bit about him. So it's, it's somebody that wasn't well known, but still um, can be brought to life. So the collections of the society are absolutely fantastic. And um, hopefully some of you might get to engage with them at some point. Okay, so on to the case study. Now, uh, many of you have heard me talk about the Lucas family before, who um, the father, Frederick Lucas, grew up in Guernsey in the Channel Islands. And um, as many large Victorian families, he had a big family. And William Lucas was his third son. And really, he became the most prominent archaeologist. He attended Trinity College in Cambridge from 1837 to 1840, uh, and then took orders, so became a, a vicar, and had various livings in um, Wiltshire at East Grafton, Great Bedouin, and Collingbourne Ducas. He married Lucy, who was the daughter of Admiral Sir Thomas Fellows. Um, and if any of you have time to watch television, the famous Downton Abbey series was written by Julian Fellows, who is a, I don't know, but he's related anyway, because his, I think she was his grandmother, was married to William Lucas, so they sort of <laughs> connect up. But anyway, uh, he um, w became a member of lots of many British and French learning societies and elected to the Society of Antiquities of London in 1855 as a fellow. He wrote at length on archaeology, but he was also interested in church bells and plates and a lot of ecclesiastical records. Uh, he lived in Wiltshire and then moved to, um, sorry, I'm not done, uh, moved to Yorkshire, to Wath, which is near York. But when he was at Cambridge, he met Sir Henry Dryden of the Dryden Literary Family. Uh, Dryden was a gentleman, he didn't have to work, but he became uh, an archaeologist, well, an antiquary, but he, he I think he deserves the epithet archaeologist as well. And it, they um, started a lifelong friendship. Uh, Dryden was the fourth baronet of Cannons Ashby in Northamptonshire, which is now Daventry, if that means anything to any of you, uh, north of London. And he was a superb draftsman as well, <coughs> and surveyor. And the pair of them used to take off in the summer months and go round and um, plan and record prehistoric monuments uh, as far apart as Scotland, Aberdeenshire, Wiltshire, Wales, uh, South East England, and then they also went to Britain. He spent quite a long time in the Karnak area and the Netherlands as well. And there's a lovely letter from William to Henry in 1840 when they were still very young men, uh, where uh, William had been at home in Guernsey planning Megalus, and he sent a letter to Dryden saying, lest you think I've been idle, I'm sending you some plans, you know, so they obviously spurred each other on. Um, so, uh, William elected a fellow in 1855, and he immediately started sending communications to the society, Tumuli in North uh, Wiltshire, and then they presented their work on the Megalus of Brittany in 1872, with very detailed um, 
plans and notes. And then um, it came to the attention of the society that he, uh, he was doing these plans all around the country. And eventually he was commissioned by the society to actually carry out these surveys in a systematic manner. Um, sorry, I'm just, just. And in fact, at the time, the president of the society was from he was in the British Museum. And he suggested that if there was enough support, that the society should publish the work in a series of fascicles <coughs> on prehistoric monuments. And Lord Carnarvon was president at the time, uh, and he supported the, um, the idea that, that they should do this. So they sent out a circular. The anniversary meetings were always on St. George's Day, the 23rd of April, uh, asking for subscriptions from the members for the publication of the plans. And enough fun, if enough funds were found, they were going to start with Cornwall, and it would be 15 shillings. So it struck me this was an early form of crowdfunding, really, mm -hmm. which was quite ahead of its time. <laughs> um, so I spent a few happy hours delving through the minutes of the Society of Antiquaries, and I can tell you that if anybody's got time or interest, they are an absolute mine of information. And I wished, in a way, that I'd had longer, but I will go back to them at some point when I get a chance. So they say things like the sum of 50 pounds be granted toward the expenses of Mr. Lucas's operations in the present summer. Uh, and curiously, he was uh, requested to defer Stonehenge. They didn't think Stonehenge needed uh, surveying at this point, which was quite curious. And complete parts of Devon uh, and adjacent counties that she'd been surveying. And he was invited to continue his surveys. And um, 50 pounds, it sounded an awful lot in, 18, in the 1880s, but in fact, uh, I, it seemed to be around £5,860, which isn't too far removed from some of the research grants that might be given today, but it was still <laughs> quite forward-thinking in those days. Uh, and, um, yes, I'm just going to read you a little quote from the minutes. Uh, that uh, the, committee, the, the council were asked about this, and they said um, that they recognised the value of the proposal, uh, made to them by one so thoroughly competent to carry it out in the most satisfactory manner. So Lucas had obviously proved his worth by them. They feel, however, that they would be doing less than justice to Mr. Lucas if they transferred it to other hands, the work, the, the surveys, which form part of the general scheme in the course of execution under that gentleman's auspices with such auspicious success. And the great liberality with which Mr. Lucas had presented or promised to present to the society large collections of scale plans and drawings of megalithic monuments at home and abroad makes it all the more incumbent on the council not to embark on any new arrangements so long as Mr. Lucas is able to give them the benefit <laughs> of his skills and experience. So he obviously convinced them that uh, his work was a good thing. So that, as I say, they spent quite a long time in Karnak, uh, the Karnak region, um, and uh, surveyed a, a lot of the major monuments, including the Table de Marchand, which will be known to many of you. Uh, and this has brought them to the attention of French archaeologists today, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Uh, and also to Stuart Piggott and Atkinson, who had excavated at Stonehenge. And again, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and these are some of the Cornwall ones. And they, they were drawn to a, a, you know, a formula. And in Lucas's own words, he coloured the capstones pink and the props with a natural tint. They used cartridge paper. The scales were all down to a standard. Um, and then they did sketches, sort of topographical sketches as well. So um, they were scientific drawings, if you like, even at that time. Uh, and then they went to Scotland as well. Dryden himself actually did more in Scotland. And, but uh, they spent a summer in 1884. I'm sorry, these are a bit pale, probably. But this is the, um, one of the sites known as the dilapidated cairn at Sunhoney. And then the Picts Cave, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, in Aberdeenshire, sorry. Okay. So they got around the country, and considering they were going by carriage, they didn't, in, well, the trains would have been coming in by the time they were going to Scotland, but the, in the early days, they would have used carriage to get around. So, um, here's some of the handwritten minutes, and I, I, I well, 
I was joking about not talking about Stonehenge uh, to somebody, but I thought I'd, I'd um, just put Stonehenge, sorry, I'm just going to read it again another little bit, where it said, although Stonehenge does perhaps stand in such urgent need of being planned and drawn as other prehistoric remains of less magnitude and importance, it has always been an understood thing that Mr. Lucas should undertake it for the society, and under the circumstances, the council are persuaded that Mr. Diamond will be the first to acknowledge that they have only one course open to them, and must deny themselves the satisfaction of making use of his obliging offer. So they sent out the circular, and they did get the money in to publish. And um, I won't go into too much detail because of time, but uh, when they sent all the plans, about 200 plans went to a lithographers, uh, and they ended up in a catastrophic fire. And I was really quite keen to try and find the reference to that place, so I ended up going through all the cash books at, at the Society and eventually did find the name of the um, lithographers. And actually, it was a man called William Griggs, and he had been quite instrumental in developing a, a technique of photolithography, so it was a slightly different form of printing. And um, I thought it was the same lithographers that printed Archaeologia, which is the journal of the Society of Antibodies, but in fact it wasn't. Um, and so it was a completely different technique. Uh, but the only reference I could find is this one, where it says that they're going to give Lucas some more money um, after a far at uh, Briggs's premises. And they were in Peckham in South London. But you can imagine the devastation that they must have felt, that Lucas himself must have felt at the time. It, you know, you hear about people losing research and losing PhDs on trains and things. I mean, these days it's a bit different because hopefully we all back everything up, get caught out occasionally, but you can sort of imagine what it must have been like. But amazingly, um, when Lord Carnarvon announced uh, in his anniversary address in 1884, that there had been this far at the lithographers, Lucas's reaction was to say, well, would you like me to do them all again? Which I must admit, I thought was quite amazing. But all is not lost because there was some outcome. And I mentioned Atkinson and Piggott, and um, Atkinson wrote in, uh, at the time of Piggott's 65th birthday in a fresh shrift, there can be no doubt if this project had been completed, it would have ranked as one of the major archeological publications of the 19th century. And really, Lucas didn't get the, uh, the, the um, kudos, if you like, that he should have done. But luckily, a lot they, they copied the plans. So a lot of them do survive in many different institutions, not just the Society of Antiquaries of London, uh, the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, the Ashmolean Museum have a lot of the French material, the Guernsey Museum have some copies, the British Museum. Um, Williams, art, he collected artifacts as well as many of them did, and his collection was sold to the British Museum just before he died and Dryden's archives are held in Northampton. Um, but uh, some uh, of the invisible surveys did get a new life. So this is a site in Scotland, Hill of Many Stains. And I'm sorry this is so pale, but Headland Archaeology, who were doing a, a digital survey of the same site, were able to use the plans to see how many stones survived and how much the site had changed in all that time from 1871 to 2004. And sorry, that should now say Historic Environment Scotland. I forgot to change it. And um, uh, uh, there were publications that came out from the archives that survived in those um, institutions I've just talked about. Um, they had been to the Dromtha uh, area in the Netherlands, and a recent survey has just been published about the Hunabedden. Richard Bradley used some of the Scottish material in his, uh, one, of his, not one of his many books, The Good Stones, where he looked at some of the clava cairns. Uh, Serge Cassan and colleagues put together all the material from the, the Karnak area in Brittany, Autour de la Table, and used a lot of the Lucas material. And my own work on the Channel Islands, I used some of his plans as well. So, my conclusion was that archives and collections are very important, and uh, of course, we must try and make them accessible. So, this material is a bit invisible, but it does survive, and uh, quite a lot of it has been digitized. The work has, um, not only is it interesting for the history of archaeology, but it has intrinsic value as well. So good things can rise from the ashes. Uh, I hope you agree. And I just wanted to say, in case you think the Society of Antigrees is a very closed society uh, for just the fellows, th this is not true at all. We are a charity, and like all charities today, we, are, we have a whole programme of outreach. People can come and study, you just have to contact the library. 
There's a whole um, series of lectures that are open to the public, and um, if anybody wants to know anything more about it, do let me know. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>